Hey, Jim here. Thanks for coming back to the channel. Today's topic is who fails scuba certification? I mean, is it really possible to fail? Come on in and join the discussion. All right, first, so is it possible to fail? And my, my answer, short answer is no, with a detailed answer, yes. But as I think about it more, I could easily reverse that. Short answer, yes, and the detailed answer is no. And who asked that question? In my experience, so people who are thinking about uh, joining a scuba class, they're gonna ask this question. And I think it's a very fruitful question for scuba instructors, uh, pros, to, to think about. Because it, it can really concentrate us on what we're looking for, what does it mean when we have our name on that card, and uh, what does it mean for a student going out into the world with a certification. From the start, there are certain contraindications to scuba diving to begin with. For example, asthma, serious ear issues or injuries, uh, other serious health issues. Please check with your certification agency's website uh, if you're interested in, in training. They'll, they can have a list there of those items. Prospective students that have any questions about these issues would have to have a physician's note before being able to enter into the in-water portion of any training. So some of these issues might keep you out of training uh, just to begin with. And that's a good thing to discuss with your instructor and or your physician. I wouldn't consider this a failure. It's just being disqualified from training from the get-go. I teach for a living, not scuba. Scuba is my side thing. I teach for a living at a university. In university and out of university, in scuba, I have the philosophy for any student, I will not give up on you until you give up on you. So that's one of my guiding principles, and that's what, <laughs> when I know when to quit. When I was younger, even if you gave up on you, I might still go for a little while, but I've gotten old and a little bit slower, so uh, I'll give up when you give up. I think that's a fair rule. Many instructors, uh, if you do a lot of reading out there, as I used to, uh, they like to pride themselves on the internet for failing a lot of students. Uh, and and I, I totally understand that, you know, they'll, you know, there are a lot of people who think that uh, you pay for scuba certification and to counter that, there's a lot of instructors to say you pay for instruction, not for certification. I totally respect that. However, when there are a lot of instructors out there who say they fail a lot of students, I'm honestly not sure what that means. I'm happy to hear an explanation, but in my experience, uh, the lifeblood of any dive group or dive club is bringing new divers into the fold. So it grows the club with enthusiastic, motivated, and often very loyal divers. So it's really needed. So there's, there's kind of a, a competing need there. So of course, uh, you need to make sure people are safe. However, uh, you really want to welcome people in. So there are two competing interests there sometimes. So I'd really like to hear from instructors who say they, they fail a lot of students. And what does that mean? Sending them away permanently, or they can make it up. I'm interested. There is a written test for any scuba certification. There's a written test and that has a passing percentage. For example, 75% as one agency. However, it is a little bit vague. That can be negotiated or remediated or retaken. So it's not completely clear uh, what that means. Uh, I've never had any student that I can recall, I've never had any student fail their total certification process because they couldn't pass the written test. However, there have been some retakes, uh, usually from open water students, I don't know what it is about open water students. They, they often crunch and they, they don't read the book and they get there and show up and like, hey, it's all good and it wasn't all good. So um, I'm, I, I try to be flexible with individual questions and going over them and letting students remediate each other. In, in this, a few cases, they've had to take the B test or take a, a full retake. As I said, uh, in my mind, my philosophy, I'm going to stick with you as long as you stick with yourself. As long as you're trying, really trying, I'm with you. I'm there. I'm supporting you. I'm your fan. So in my mind, someone who has challenges, I can work with them on their open water course or their advanced course, whatever it is, as long as they want. As long as they have the time, the patience, and I guess the money. Because here, in my area, I have to pay for pool. We have to pay for ocean. We just can't go and dive ocean wherever we want. Please see the Scuba Steve versus the, the Fisherman's Mafia of why I can't do that. So if someone needs uh, an extra dive or two, uh, that's no problem for me as long as I can schedule and as long as a student can schedule. I have that flexibility because generally my divers live somewhere close to me. In fact, one time, as I recall, uh, one diver needed an extra couple weeks to work on mass clearing on his or her own before returning to the course and completing successfully. I can't recall any students that have failed the course because there was any one skill that they couldn't master at the open water level. The swims. 
The swims have been a difficult part for students, surprisingly. I guess it's common for people not to be able to swim well. And understandable. Jogging is an easy thing. Swimming is a little more, more of a challenge. Uh, swim skills in recent years have, among, I think, all of the agencies, there's been a move toward reducing the rigorousness of the swim requirements. Generally, there's some kind of a swim, either a distance or a skill check to see, to check your strokes. Uh, there's some kind of a survival float or tread water, and there's usually some kind of a, of a snorkel uh, swim for distance. Surprisingly, the, the <laughs> surprisingly, the survival float tread water ha has occasionally been an issue in the past. In fact, one time there was actually a save on that item I had. When that activity goes on, there's either myself or a, a dive master watching the students, and generally it's in a four meter pool, small pool, only maybe, I don't know, 15 feet by 15 feet, and a uh, dive master is watching, or I'm watching, and, and a student almost drowned and needed, needed to be rescued. Uh, that student was allowed to finish that task at another time after some practice, and that's generally what happens with swims. I've never had someone disqualified on the swims. Naui also has an underwater swim, and that's sometimes a challenge for students. However, again, I've never had a student uh, fail on, on that. Uh, they've always taken some retries, but they always improve quite a lot. But everybody so far has, has passed that requirement. As a note, the swim requirements and whether scuba divers should be able to swim is a whole debated topic on the internet that I don't want to get into. Um, however, it is true that swimming is more difficult than scuba in general. S swimming, uh, you need to, at, at least at some points, you need to keep your head above the water, and that takes energy to breathe. With scuba, that requirement is removed because you can breathe under the water. You don't need the energy of propping your head out of the water. And most swimmers who are not very proficient, they're trying to keep their head too far out of the water. So scuba is easier than swimming and easier, a bit easier than snorkeling. However, I'm not going to debate how necessary or unnecessary the skill of swimming is for scuba training. That's for another, another day. Ear issues. Ear issues are the number one reason that I have students quit or discontinue their course. Being unable to equalize due to past injury or congenital issues uh, is, is the reason. Uh, some folks also may injure or stress their ears during the pool training. This could be an issue for the ocean for me. So generally, I like to have the pool training and the ocean training within a couple weeks of each other. So there's good, uh, good memory and muscle memory of, of all the skills. However, I don't want them to be too close together because very often in the pool, students will stress their ears or sometimes even injure their ears. And then if the ocean training is, is too close, their ears are still out of commission and they won't be able to equalize. So it's kind of a fine balance of too close or too far. One area where students uh, w will sometimes injure their ears in the pool, besides general act of diving, is free diving. So for example, Naui has a free diving rescue that's required and they have to go down to like 3.5 meters, three to four meters. And free diving to a depth like that is you're actually more liable to injure your ears than with diving because on a tank, you have essentially an infinite amount of time to equalize your ears on the way down, right? And an infinite amount of air. Whereas free diving, you're limited in time and limited in the air. And so students will sometimes try to go down to three or four meters without equalizing, which is deep enough to hurt your ears. So for that particular skill, if someone doesn't seem to be getting the equalizing in general right, I might save that totally, even the practice, until the ocean, which is a little more difficult, but it's a sacrifice to be made. The ocean dives. They're not really a test, but there are hurdles to be mastered. So here, the candidates have to demonstrate some skills, but more importantly, they're supposed to integrate all those skills into a fluid dive where they demonstrate first that they're safe, they're not a danger to themselves or to others, and they demonstrate good dive planning, good air management, nitrogen management, buddy skills, buoyancy, navigation, equipment use, and familiarity, etc. There are cases where I've required students to do an extra dive or two uh, for a student to demonstrate enough safety and or competence to earn the pass, to earn the card. I usually ask the student themselves about this. I'll say, hey, here's what I'm seeing. I'm feeling like you're not comfortable enough or you're not safe enough or you're not really getting it. You don't seem stable. What do you think? And very often, if they're honest with themselves and they're not comfortable, of course, they're gonna say something like that. Like say, yeah, you know what? I wanna be safe. I wanna be comfortable. I'd like another dive or two. The only time they might not admit this is in the, the couple's training syndrome. And I'm gonna have another video on that at a later time because that's a fun topic actually. There's a couple very rare cases 
or even with extra practice, a student or students in my past was barely able to get up to standards. And I had the feeling, all right, right now, at this instant, they're just there. Uh, but I advised them. I said, listen, I had the talk, right, the talk. I said, listen, uh, I'm going to certify you. You've worked hard. I think you're there. However, you should begin diving immediately because if you take a break of, of six months and then come back to diving, you're going to need a refresher, I'm guessing. You're, you're going to forget the muscle memory, the, the skills, the, the fluidity, the comfort. You're not going to be safe, perhaps, for yourself and for others. And even worse, if you go away from the sport and come back in a year, and if you come back to me, I'm going to consider you a non-diver, a non-certified diver, because you, you can't afford to take, to take that time off. It's been a hard conversation. I've done it once or twice in the past. And incidentally, in the rare instances I've done that, the person came back in like a year, and I was just slapping my head. <laughs> I consider myself lucky in a sense because I'm not a resort location and most of my divers, they're working individuals. They work here, they live here. I could see them occasionally if there's a problem, if there's weather, if there's a health issue, they can come back. A resort situation it has much different requirements. If you go somewhere for a long weekend or for a week and you have some difficulties, there's a weather problem, you have a health problem, or you have a skill issue, you might not have enough time to complete that certification in the resort context. That could be a totally different situation. My guess is resorts have a much higher failure rate for these kinds of reasons. I'd be happy for resorts to comment down below and tell me their experience. Last, there is something that most agencies have. You're going to be certified for diving with a dive professional to limited depths. Your only buddy can be that dive professional, an instructor or diver, depending on the agency. And that would be ideal for someone who, who has not demonstrated the skills in the ways that I listed beforehand and it falls within the structure of the certifying agency. In addition, in the future, it will be easy for that student get some experience with an instructor on those dives as they as they like get some experience up get some comfort up then they can apply with that instructor to have a couple certification dives to move up to the full independent license so they can dive with a, a regular buddy pair with their partner their family members their friends in summary absolute failures of the course are very rare in my experience and usually they're people who gave up themselves because of a health issue and the course should be viewed more as a process than not like a one-point evaluation where something is happening and because it's a process you know the instructor can, can be flexible to help slower learners out all right so that's my complicated answer to the complicated question uh, can a student actually fail a open water scuba certification it's a yes and a no I'd be happy to hear your comments down below especially instructors what are your experiences and, and students alike I will see you on the beach thank you I saw that going differently in my mind.